have him start with us. Before he gets started with his unique skills, I would like to have a brief um, introduction about what who he is and what he's done. Sea Star, also known as Mr. History, is a state and national award-winning editorial cartoonist whose work appeared in the Forum of Fargo Moorhead. He has illustrated four books and has published thousands of cartoons in magazines, newspapers, and other publications. He lives in Fargo and likes to uncover forgotten tales while using his skills as a cartoonist in illustrated history-telling historical stories while fast drawing those stories in charcoal on giant 20 feet rolls of paper. Star also has performed at Theodore Roosevelt since 1985 across North Dakota and 18 other states, including Washington, D.C., and on the History Channel and the History Channel International. He was the head writer and performer on the Dakota Air radio show that travels across North Dakota in live musical, historical, and comedic presentations. The show was broadcast four times monthly on North Dakota Prairie uh, Public Radio. He's known on the east end of the state as Mr. History for his school performances and his appearances on the History Channel and the National Public Radio. With that, I'd like to request you all to welcome Steve Starr. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And she, she didn't say a proud NDSU graduate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Undergraduate yeah. class of 1972. How many of you remember 1970? <laughs> the union was quite different looking back then. It was not a, what a wonderful spot. And uh, I dressed in my historical clothes today because these are the kind of clothes that a man would have worn back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Although I would not have been a gentleman if I were to wear my hat indoors, if you'll allow me the, the theatricality of this. And, and I'll wear my hat too. They'd wear an old frock coat like this, a long black coat. They came in one color black and uh, always had a vest with those. And I carry in my vest uh, in pocket one of the things that no man would have been uh, caught without back in those old days, and that is a pocket watch. And this is a very a special pocket watch to me because this belonged to my great grandfather a man I never met. He died about six years before I was born. Came over from the, the, uh, the country of uh, Norway, speaking Norwegian, and moved to Wisconsin. And uh, I love holding on to this, as anybody knows who enjoys having artifacts in their own family. It becomes very, very important to hold on to part of your family's past. And I think specifically because, of the, because it's a timepiece that tells the passage of time, and that's what history is, the passage of time. Uh, things happen in the past. And the changes that come about, and we're all connected to it. We're all connected to it. And now that you are all here, at least for today and for a short or a long time in, here in the Red River Valley and celebrating Earth Day, I wanted to delve into some of what I think are the most important elements about the history of this very, uh, this, this unique place, this very important place, not only to our state and, and to the surrounding states and country, but, but ultimate to, ultimately to the rest of the world. And so we're going to go back in history uh, to, the, to the very early days, to the, uh, to the first people that were living here, of course, out in this area, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a, a civilization that, that we know everything about because the original Native Americans, the American Indians that were uh, out here in this valley are, are pretty much unknown to us. We don't know their names. We know the ones that came l later, the ones that have been here perhaps uh, seven or eight hundred years ago. But I'm going to talk about the two of these important people, uh, peoples and nations and how they would, uh, you know, even relate to today, even by, by language and, and words we use. There's one group here that had been here in the early days, and uh, they were a hunting people. They had horses, and they were hunters, and they would uh, call themselves the friends or allies, or an alliance of friends. That's how they referred to themselves. 
The name that we give all of them now, Indians, of course, was they never referred to themselves as Indians. Indians in the early days, Christopher Columbus had come over, thought he had found the Indies, and called the natives Indians after that. And that's how they, they, they got that. Just one of many times when their, their, their language is, is, uh, is uh, rejected by, by the, the Europeans. But we have these people who are called an alliance of friends. But I said that in English. In their language, they called themselves the Dakota, the Dakota people. So they are living here. And they're living up in this, in this, uh, this region. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just draw a, a, a brief little, little map of our region here. And they, they come down here to this region and then uh, fall in to, with a bad way with the other group of natives I'm going to, to speak about, the Ojibwa. Uh, the, the Dakota come down here, but then they, uh, they end up going down into this part of what would become the state next to us. And the Dakota live there, and they give that entire place a name. They call it where the lakes are the color of the sky, describing things, you know, in, their be in that beautiful language of, of uh, dealing through nature and the, and, and the earth itself. So they call this land where the lakes are the color of the sky. But in, I said that in English, in, their, in the Dakota language, they say Minnesota, Minnesota. And so the Dakota people, where we get the name of our territory first, Dakota Territory, which then turns into North and South Dakota, comes from the Dakota people as well as the state of Minnesota, now named there. There's another group that, uh, that they, they met, I, I mentioned them, the Ojibwa. The Ojibwa are li living primarily up in this region of what would be called Minnesota later on. And the Ojibwa are living there by a lake that we still have today over there in Minnesota. And they call it Meniskagami, Meniska. Gami, which uh, is the native word, the Ojibwa word for water that is red. And it meant oh, any body of water. It could mean a river. It could mean a lake. It, uh, it could uh, mean, you know, a, a stream. And so they are living by this lake that they called Meniska Gami. And... Uh, they are calling it the red water because of uh, the organic material tannin, which comes out of the woods, the forest. This is all forest land at the time. And that tannin, that chemical, gets into, uh, into the water and actually creates sort of a reddish or maroon color. And so the Ojibwas, which in their language would mean the original people, they name this uh, Meniska Gami, red water, for the lake, for the river that comes out of it, and for the river that that smaller river flows into that goes north. Now the Ojibwa are living here. They're not getting along well with the Dakota. That is why they fought and sent the Dakota down into this part of the state. And so they are, uh, the Ojibwa, unlike the Dakota, who are horse people, have horses, and they are nomadic, and so they move all over, uh, usually, uh, you know, just following the bison, the great North American bison. And um, the, the, the Dakota are one of the, the great people of Native Americans on the high plains and prairies that hunted and relied on the North American bison. Now, we can also call him the buffalo, and when we call him the buffalo, that uh, we all know, uh, you know what beast we are referring to. But 
the, the correct name really would be the North American bison that he's only found in North America. Just like the American bald eagle, he is purely American, can't find him anywhere else. We can find buffalo, water buffalo in, in India, water buffalo in Africa, but only the American bison is, uh, is here. The Indians called him Tatanka. Tatanka. And so they would be hunting him here. And the bison were plentiful coming uh, out from the west and the southwest into this region, very close to us, just, uh, just a few miles away. Uh, in Minnesota, we have a place called Buffalo River. And that is named because the buffalo, the bison, actually would roam into that area. And right here in this part of Cass County, uh, we had bison, the, the, the buffalo the bison running through here. So uh, now the D Dakota have gone down here, and for hundreds of years the, the uh, natives are, are living here. And uh, then they uh, are first visited by people in this region uh, who are coming primarily from the north and what would become the Dominion of Canada. And these men who are coming in are not coming in to take land. They're not coming in for really any other business other than to hunt. And so these Frenchmen, uh, French trappers and hunters, are coming in to uh, hunt the beaver. Now, today, today, traditionally, we think that the beaver, which is an animal that lives by the by the by rivers would be trapped but before traps were made the frenchmen were, were actually coming over here and and hunting the, the beaver uh and they would be get hunted with with their their muskets and later on traps would come in so these french trappers are coming into this this region and uh as they come in here they meet many of the ojibwa women and when the two groups meet, the thing that happens is what happened all across the world since time began when two groups meet. About nine months later, a whole new group of people uh, are, <laughs> are introduced to life on this planet. And so the sons and daughters of the French fur trappers and the Ojibwa women, they are given a name uh, by the French themselves, Métis, M-E-T-I-S, Métis. It means mixed or mixed blood. And so the Métis name has stuck even till today so that all the, all the descendants of Ojibwa and sometimes the, the native group called the Cree, but mainly Ojibwa and the French are Métis to this very day. And they were up in this region. Well, they came to this region because of the beaver. The beaver was up here. The beaver that provided the best fur to make the most popular hat in all of history was the, uh, the beaver hat. And the beaver hats were made, and they were worn by ladies and gentlemen all over Europe, rich or poor, all wanted a beaver hat. And the beaver hat was ideal uh, you know, for a hat, a long-lasting hat, and especially good in bad weather, because the beaver fur, the beaver pelt, repels water. And so... The, uh, the trappers would, uh, would hunt the beaver, and they would, um, they would take that, that uh, beautiful uh, beaver pelt, the close beaver pelt right by the skin, called the wool of the beaver. It's wool because it's made into another fabric. It's made into a beaver felt. That is put on a hat form, and uh, then that hat form goes for ladies and gentlemen and even military to wear. It was the most popular hat in, for hundreds of years over in Europe. 
Europe nearly destroyed all the beavers over there. They were trying to find other beavers that they could get from Russia or the Scandinavian countries, but that did not work as well. So they looked to the North American continent looking for the beavers. Because our northern beaver lived up here in the, in the north, of course, that was the ideal beaver. The beaver does not hibernate because he does not hibernate by living all throughout the winter. Nature provides him with a thicker wool, thicker fur. And so he has more to offer to be able to make more hats. The hat makers themselves then uh, work many years to, know how, to learn how to make a beaver hat and make a beaver felt out of it. We don't do that any longer, but it was a pattern of, of felt. And um, they would, uh, in fact, it was very dangerous to be a beaver hat maker, to be a hatter, because you worked with mercury. And if they worked with too much mercury, the mercury would get on the beaver uh, uh, fur, the, and it would sort of open up the fur, it open up the fur's little barbs in there. And that would make the beaver felt fur close together, sort of like uh, like Velcro, a form of Velcro. And that, that was what provided great felt, beaver felt for the beaver hat. But working with mercury, that mercury could get into your body and it was very dangerous. They knew it was dangerous. We knew it was dangerous for, for many years. When I was in junior high, in science class, we used to play with mercury. Uh, you, you can't do that any longer in, in this country. Uh, at South High, a couple of years ago, a little, a little beaker of mercury spilled on the floor, and they closed down the science wing and called the hazmat team from Minneapolis to come up and, and clean it up. So things have changed. But, but the, the terrible things that could happen when you're a hat maker was that you could uh, lose your hearing, you could lose your, you lose motor control, you could lose your power of speech, you could, you could go, as we used to say in the old days, go mad, go crazy, you could lose your mind. And so, uh, everybody knew this all over the world, uh, uh, what happened to hatters. People knew it here in the United States too after the, after the, uh, the fur trading uh, came over here to the, to the North American continent. 